Hallelujah. Please be seated. How many of you are here tonight? Amen. Have you enjoyed the conference? Praise God. A few days ago, actually it was February 24th, 5.30 in the morning, I was praying and Jesus came into the room and I immediately was drawn to the nail prints in his hand. I don't know why, I've never... I've never focused on that before, but there was something about the nail prints in his hand this time that spoke. And as I was looking at those nail prints, I was reminded of the price that he paid for every one of us to be here tonight. And I was asking him, I said, Lord, what is it you want to say to me? I knew this was a very unusual visitation. And he looked me in the eye and he said, come with me. And he took me by the hand and immediately we were standing in the atmosphere above Asia Pacific over the ocean. And we were headed somewhere, but we stopped. And we were over the islands of Fiji, where my wife Reshma is from. You know, the Fiji Islands, well, let me, let me say this way. When I was 14 years old and got saved, the first scripture that ever spoke to me, if you will, that brought revelation into my life and my heart, is the Lord spoke to me out of Jeremiah chapter 1. And he said loud and clear, and I'll never forget this. Before I formed you in the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. And I didn't even know what that was. When I asked pastors and leaders at that time in the 70s, they said, well... You're probably going to be a missionary, maybe an evangelist. There was no paradigm for profit. And so I began years of training by the Spirit of God. You know, I, I'd always prayed. I'd, I, I'm a person who loves to read, and I read, read a lot of church history and a lot about past movements of God. And there's one thing I recognize that always disturbed me. Many men and women of God started out very well, but they ended horribly. And the cry of my heart is, Lord, it doesn't matter to me how I start, but I want to finish well. I'd rather make the mistakes up front and learn thereby than make the biggest mistake of my life at the end of my life and have everything for naught. And so the process of progressing through seasons of instruction and brokenness and conformity to Christ brought me to a, a time frame in 1998 when I was invited to go to the Fiji, Fiji Islands. And I won't get into all those details, but it was, it was an amazing trip. But here's what happened. The very first morning... I landed on a Saturday morning at 5 in the morning, 
My first meeting was Sunday morning. And so when we got up on Sunday morning, we were walking from the missionary's home up to the church. And it was an uphill walk, not very far. But I kept looking over my shoulder and I saw the interior of the, the islands and there were mountains there. And every time I looked, I heard the word earthquake. And I'd shake my head and we'd talk a little more as we were walking. I'd look back and I'd say, I heard earthquake. After the third or fourth time, I asked the pastor walking with me, I said, Pastor David, have you ever had an earthquake in, in Fiji? He said, uh, what's that? I went, oh, nothing, never mind. And so when we got to the church and I was released to stand up and minister, the Lord told me to prophesy. I said, Lord, I just got here. This is not the nice word to be bringing forth. This is what the Lord said. There's going to be an earthquake in Fiji and it will be a sign to you of the shaking up of the religious system and the established order in government because Fiji will be saved. And I left it at that. Nobody said anything and I went, good. That night when I was invited back to the church to speak, the Lord gave me another prophetic word. He said, prophesy rain. That's like prophesying rain here in the Philippines during the rainy season. I said, you have got to be kidding, Lord. But he wouldn't let me go. And so I began to prophesy that there was about to be a rainstorm unlike anything they had ever seen before. And it would not just touch one island, it would touch the whole archipelago. And people, it's a sign to them of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And people will come from all over the world, not for the sun, the surf, and the sand, but because of the move of God. And Jesus would be on the tongue of every individual here. And after the meeting, some leaders came up and said, do you realize we've been in nine months drought? I said, what? I never heard of such a thing. A drought in a tropical island. Here's what happened. Tuesday, there was an earthquake. It caused a small tsunami to strike the coral coast, they call it. Well, you know, the seas speak of the nations. It was a prophetic picture of the nations coming to the shores of Fiji. And then Thursday, it began to rain on every island in the archipelago. archipelago. And the Lord spoke to me and said, remember your call. I called you as a prophet to the nations. This is the first nation you're a prophet over. And that was a frightening thing. So now back to February 24th, we stopped over Fiji. And I said, Lord, what's happening? He said, look at the islands. He said, it's time. And I knew immediately what he meant. It's time for the great awakening in Fiji. But it's not just Fiji. Many years ago, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, when the, the last move of God begins, it will begin in the island nations. And he said, it's time. That's a good place for an amen. amen. We then moved on over Australia. And as we were above Australia, all of a sudden, I saw a, ma a, a major earthquake and Australia was rent from Adelaide two-thirds of the way up the continent and it opened up. And I said, dear Lord, what is this? He said, there will be such a Massive earthquake in Australia that it will tear the continent apart. But it's a sign that I am shaking up everything that mankind thinks they have firmly established. And I will visit that nation and there will be a great awakening.
Immediately I, after I wrote that out, I sent it to some friends of ours in Australia. I said, look, this is what I'm hearing. What do you have to say? What, what do you think? And he wrote me back, Jose and Stella Rocco. They said, that's interesting. The Lord told us that about three years ago, the very same word from the end. Exactly what you saw is the same thing we saw. So why am I saying this? Because there is an acceleration of the time. There are things that are happening now so quickly. And the prophetic promises that God has given you for your life were in the season of fulfillment. You've got to grab hold of the promise of God and understand the times and the seasons we are in. There has never been a day like this. In the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Who is left among you who saw this house in its first glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is it not in your eyes? There's nothing? Everywhere we've traveled for the last 20, 30 years, you know, Human nature is, is the same all over the world, in every culture, in every nation. For some reason, we have a tendency to look backward and desire what was. Oh, we want a revival like the Azusa Street revival. Oh, we want a revival like the Welsh revival. Oh, we want a revival like this. And, and, and something in my heart would always say, no! I don't want to go backward. And I, one day I said, Lord, why, why does that rise up in me? He said, because every past revival that has ever come upon planet Earth was nothing more than a birth pang. Because what he's about to do is going to culminate in every past birth pang, bringing forth the greatest awakening the world's ever known. Would I have liked to see what happened at Azusa Street? Yeah. But we're going to see it in this generation. We've got to stop looking backwards. We can learn from the past, but we focus on the future. Because the greatest days of the church are just ahead of us. I'm not talking years, I'm talking days ahead of us. There is an urgency in the spirit, in particular in this year, that I don't fully understand, but I've known from the beginning of the year that things by the end of this year are going to be extremely dark and difficult for the world, but for the people of God, we're about to step into our own. We're about to come into the fullness of what God has said. And we're going to understand what it means to make declaration and decrees that come to pass because we're people called to be like him. I cannot tell you the, the urgency of the hour, the, the burning in my spirit. And you know, I've been contending with God for the three days I've been here. I said, Lord, I feel so empty. I feel like I've brought nothing to the table. Father, what is this? This is what he told me today. I am creating a, a void in my people. I'm cleaning out the dross. I'm removing everything that has hindered them because I'm about to fill it with my presence. And he said, there will be demonstrations of my presence in the lives of my people that were unexpected yet will bring tremendous joy and great insight and revelation into who I am and who they are. I said, okay. So I'm telling you the truth. When we came in here for those two songs in worship, I had no idea what I was going to share with you. But God, now he's taught me to do that for years. Because it says in Jeremiah chapter 1, don't say I'm young and I have nothing to speak, but just open your mouth and I'll fill it.
But this is the scripture. Who is left among you who saw this house in its first glory? Let me tell you something. Look at that scripture differently. You are the temple of God. The first glory we ever experienced was our new birth, then the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And the Lord is saying, we're about to see a greater glory in this house than we've ever known before. We've got to stop looking at the building called the church and start realizing we are the church. And the glory that is about to come is going to come in you. It must be. That's biblical principle. It's going to be nothing in comparison to what has been. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. It was interesting. We, we got to spend a weekend with Pastor Joe and Melinda at their church in Lancaster. And we hadn't been there in, what, 10 years, Joe? I don't remember. So long. And as we were ministering, you know, you can tell when the prophetic mantle comes. And I gave a prophetic word. There's going to be an earthquake. I said, God, can I prophesy on something other than earthquakes? But it wasn't bad because the word was that they would feel it, but there'd be no damage. It's a sign to them that the promise of the great awakening in their valley was about to take place. That was on Sunday. On Tuesday, they had the earthquake. That's why it was so significant. After that, when I came home and had that encounter with God at 5.30 in the morning, again, he reminded me of the earthquake in Fiji. Not once, but twice we prophesied it. And he's telling me, I don't know how he talks to you, I know how he talks to me. He's saying, this is the hour of the fulfillment of those things I've showed you. There's a quick, quick work that God's about to perform. I believe with all my heart, if I'm hearing the Spirit of God correctly, we are going to see this break forth this year. And I want to tell you something. I, I'm just going to throw this out there. If you want to be involved in the next great move of God, a good place to start for a missions trip is Fiji. Because God is about to explode in that island nation. Amen or oh no. And listen, it's not just going to be there. But I know for a fact, it's, that's one of the places. I know it's going to happen here in the Philippines. And then he said, I will shake the nations and the precious gift of all the nations will come. And I shall fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. What's the precious gift of all nations? People. He goes on to say the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Silver speaks of sanctification and redemption. Gold speaks of holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. He's saying those are mine to release in this hour. That's why the glory of this latter house will far surpass that of the former. Because the Lord is about to do something never witnessed on the scale and to the extent he's about to do. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The glory of this latter house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and I will give peace in this place. Let me tell you something. In the midst of chaos and unrest throughout the world, the greatest gift God can give you is His peace. Why aren't you afraid when all this is happening? Because I've got Jesus. I will not be moved. I'm not going to allow the circumstances of this life to cause me to get into unrest. 
Job 8, verse 7, it says, Then although your beginnings were small, your future will be very great indeed. I prophesy that over you tonight. That's your verse. Job 8, 7, that is your verse. Take that and grab it tightly. That's from the Spirit of God. So I said, Lord, how do we position ourselves for what you're about to do? I know there's nothing that we can make happen, but we can agree with your word and position ourselves by faith so that we are in the flow of what you want to do. He said, remember Solomon. I said, okay. Let me show you something about Solomon. There were a number of things in Solomon's life that positioned him for the greatest work of God in his generation. In 1 Chronicles 22.9, prophesying to David, it says, Behold, a son will be born to you who shall be a man of rest. Now there's a key. Rest. Similar to peace, but not the same. Rest. Remember when Jesus first called the disciples, he said, let's get into the boat and go to the other side. Now Jesus gave them a command. They didn't realize that at the time. They thought maybe it's a suggestion. Can we go to the other side? So they followed him into the boat. Always remember that. The disciples always followed Jesus. He didn't follow them. They didn't say, hey, Jesus, come on with us. Let's do this. He said, follow me. The boat spoke of their ministry. I love this picture. So Jesus got into the boat. They followed him into the boat. So Jesus entered the ministry. They followed him in ministry. They put off from the shore. and They're going across the sea. And he's in the back of the boat asleep. And all of a sudden, this massive storm comes up. And it begins to swamp the boat. Now these are seasoned fishermen. They're, they know what it's like to be on this sea of Galilee. And boy, when the wind whips up, you can get huge waves. And they're terrified. They think we're going down. And He's just in the back of the boat sleeping. What is this? And they woke him and said, don't you care? We're about to perish. And he stood up and he rebuked the sea and the winds. And he said, peace be still. You know what it is in the Greek, the, the, the wind and the waves? It was the Greek word seismos. There was an underwater earthquake that created a tsunami that was about to swamp them. And he said, peace be still. And immediately calm came. And that brought the fear of God. So the question is, how could Jesus be asleep in the back of the boat with all of this upheaval taking, going on in the world around him? Because the sea speaks of the nations. Simple. He had a command from God. You're to go to the other side and minister there. So his faith was in the word of God, not in the circumstances of life. And he was at rest. I'll pay attention to this. He was at rest because he knew nobody could take his life. He had a destiny. You know, the same visionary that invited me to Fiji those years ago had a granddaughter who was 27, 28, hadn't been married, and she was getting anxious. She wanted to be married and have children. That was her dream. That was her vision for her life. And, and so... I was asked to pray. And so I said, okay, Father, I'll pray. And I began to pray and I, I had a prophetic word. You're going to be married and I, you're going to have three children. And it's not going to be years away. Within two years, you'll, you'll be married and have children. And sure enough, the man of her dreams came into her life. She got married and she's having her first child. This is about a year and a half later. One day I got a phone call and they're, they're, they're frantic. They're calling me on the phone. 
She's in labor and she's, her, her vitals are going down and they, they, might have to, they might be able to save the baby, but they don't know if they can save her. What, you know, we need you to pray. What is the Lord saying? I said, what do you mean what is the Lord saying? He already spoke. He told you, he told her she would be married and have three children. Stop panicking, it's okay. And they said, oh, and they hung up. <laughs> And everything was okay. That's the word of the Lord. You see, we either truly trust his word or we don't. I understand the battle in every life. I understand that. I've had seasons of that too. The good news is there's a grace coming right now. Because of intimacy with God, because the passion of your heart is to know him, you're going to know him. And from that intimacy will come rest. Because when you know Him, you trust Him. Amen. You trust Him. What's the worst the world can do is threaten you with heaven. Hallelujah. So behold, a son will be born to you who shall be a man of rest. No striving, no anxiety, no worry, no, just rest. And I shall give him rest from all of his enemies all around. Oh, I like that. How would you like to have rest from all of your enemies? You see, Scripture says that if you walk with God, He'll even make your enemies to be at peace with you. Rest. I'm reminded of my dad who used to travel behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet Union before the wall came down and communism fell for a season. I mean, the tales he would tell would scare the staunchest of us. I mean... <laughs> There was a grace on their life. He and his friend that did this. They would smuggle in Bibles and smuggle out pastors. And, you know, they'd have to, they'd put it out in plain sight. They'd just put Bibles on the seat or in the, the boot of the car, the trunk. And every few miles there'd be a checkpoint. And those guards would put mirrors in there and down the gas tank. And, I mean, under the car. They'd open the trunk and they'd root they never saw the Bibles. Why? Because God gave them a word. You're going to take this. This is the man you deliver it to. He will distribute it. And so they were at rest. Even when they were bringing in truckloads of food and, and clothes and things during Polish perestroika when there was an embargo and people were starving. He had the favor of God and the ambassador from, from Poland said, would you please bring these things in? He said, sure, we'll do that. He said, good, bring it to this warehouse and we'll distribute it. And my dad said, absolutely not. We'll take it to the underground church. They'll distribute it. And the ambassador said, fine, just get this stuff to my people. And on their manifest, they would list 20,000 Bibles. They'd list everything in there. So one day they were crossing the border and the guard, for some reason, caught that. He said, pull in there. So they had to pull into the warehouse. And they took my dad and his friend up into an office where they could overlook and see in the warehouse. And they took everything out of the truck. And they were up there for hours being interrogated. And you know what was happening on the floor? Those 14 guards that took everything out of the truck were sitting down reading Bibles for 12 hours. Finally, my dad's friend Richard stood up, looked at the lieutenant and said, you put everything back on that truck and you make sure it's all there or we're going to, you're going to hear from a higher authority. And he was terrified. He didn't know they were talking about God. <laughs> they put it all back and they counted the Bibles. And they counted the Bible. And finally the lieutenant came up and said, I'm so sorry, there's five Bibles missing. 
And they started to, they were about to say, and they went, wait a minute. So my dad leaned over and said, would you like one too? He said, shh, yes, but not in front of the men. They loaded up the truck. When they got to their destination, they unloaded it, handed out the Bibles, and they had all their Bibles because God multiplied them. Rest. Rest. If God speaks, it's done. We've got to cultivate that understanding. His name will be Solomon and I shall give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. Here's what you have to understand. If you become a person of rest, especially those of you who are called to serve in government, if you understand the principle of rest and you become a man or a woman of rest, God will bring rest and peace in this nation. In the midst of chaos and the world gone crazy, you can have a, a nation at rest and in peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. He didn't say you have to be a, a nation of perfection. If one can put a thousand to flight, and two, ten thousand, and, and you figure it out. How many are in here? This nation's in trouble because you have more influence in the court of heaven than the devil does. And your prayers have been changing and will continue to change this nation. Don't stop on the finish line. Keep going. It's interesting that ancient rabbis and the Talmud said the Lord actually had an act of creation on the seventh day. They said he created rest on the seventh day. And then he says, strive to enter that rest. I find that interesting. Why? Second Peter 3, 8 says a day with the Lord is as 1,000 years and 1,000 years is a day. From the time of Jesus until the turn of the century, we've completed 2,000 years and two days, or two days, and we're early in the morning on the third day. But here's the interesting thing. We can go back 4,000 years from Jesus to Adam. So from Adam until the turn of the century, we have completed 6,000 years or six days, and now we're early in the morning on the day of rest. And God's going to teach us how to be at rest. Ceasing from our own works. Stop striving in our own understanding and our own strength, but be a people of rest. And when we enter into this rest, we have just removed our flesh from the equation and now God can do anything through you because you're at rest. You still with me? So he was a man of rest. Now listen, 2 Chronicles, 7, Chronicles 1, 7 through, well, just 7. It said, in that night, what night? I love this. I've studied night, evening, night, and morning. One of the aspects of night we can look at it in metaphor or type, it speaks of darkness covering the earth, gross darkness to people, the changing of an, into a new day or the end of the age. Keep that in mind. So I'll just read it this way. At the end of the age, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. How would you like the Lord to show up to you tonight and say, ask me whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Because he was a man of rest. He had access to a face-to-face -face encounter with God. See, so many people get so anxious. I want to see God. How do I do it? Give me 37 steps. No, I want three steps. No, I want five steps. No, I... Here it is. Just rest. He's already promised it. So how does that look? What does rest look like? Father, thank you. It's mine. Because he gave the word. Thank you, Father. 
And in that place of rest, you'll have visitation. Amen or oh no. So he said, ask whatever you want. I had the Lord do that to me one time. You want to hear about that? It was a friend of group. We were ministering in Kuala Lumpur, the French church. Actually, it wasn't a church. It was an office building because they can't build churches. And so it was an industrial area, long street, gated uh, compounds in every industrial complex. But this looked more like an office building. It was four floors. And there was a gate with a guard and a gate shack. And it was pouring down rain. And I'm going to cut the story short a little bit. And so I pulled up in the car and got out. And the pastor had just arrived, he and his wife. So they said, well, we got in the elevator to go up together. And the Lord said, ask of me a sign. And I went, oh. I said in my heart, Lord, I'm asking that Jesus will come in the meeting tonight and everybody will see him. So I told the pastor and his wife what the Lord had said and what I, what I responded. And they said, oh, amen, we agree, yeah. And we went up into the meeting. During the worship, while the worship's going on, there's an elder still by the gate to help direct people in. And this man came walking up to the gate. They didn't know where he came from, and he was all dressed in white. But he was walking like this. And they thought, oh my goodness, what happened to him? And he had glasses on and sandals on his feet. He came up to the gate shack and he said, may I come in? And the elder was moved with compassion. He said, please let me help you. And he took him to the elevator. He said, well, listen, we're going to go up to the third floor. The meeting was on the fourth floor. There's offices and there's a restroom. You just go into the men's room, into the first stall, and I'll go to the office and find you something dry. And this is what the man said. No, the first stall is dirty. I'll go into the third stall. So they got up. He led him out by the door to the restroom. He ran down to the office rooted around, found a black t-shirt and quickly grabbed that and a hot cup of coffee and ran back to the restroom. And this is what happened. The man looked at the t-shirt and he said, no, I don't wear black. And, and I don't like coffee. I'm trying to help you. But he had grace in his heart. And it's not about wearing black. Don't, don't, it was a test for the many of you that are wearing black. So, he went back to the office, rummaged around, he found a bottle of water and a, a red t-shirt. So he came back, and when he came in the room, the man said, oh, I love red, and he grabbed the t-shirt. And so, he began to take off this wet shirt, and the elder almost had a panic attack because this man was just flayed within an inch of his life. You ever see the passion of Christ? That's what he looked like. He had a hole in his side and holes in his hands. And, but he just, and glasses. See, he was in disguise. <laughs> and he just thought, this man's been beat up. It's terrible. So they got him dressed. and I, I was up teaching by that time. And I see this guy walking up with an elder, this man in red. Glasses, and they sat down on the front and he would sit like this and, and the pastor said you put Jesus to sleep with your message I said brother he was at rest <laughs> he trusted me he probably would have been wide awake for your message but here's what happened. Every time there was a flash of lightning and thunder outside, and he'd look up and say, he said to the elder sitting with him, they're trying to get in, but they can't. Of course, the elder's kind of going, really? And then he'd just close his eyes and sit there. And, and any time I mentioned the name of Jesus or the blood of Jesus, he'd say, did somebody call me? 
At the end of the message, I thank God I don't remember what the message was. We, the pastor sent another elder who was an, an MD, a doctor, over to assess what this man needed in prayer. When he got there and examined the man, he wanted to call the aid car. He said, this man belongs in a hospital, and the man refused. So the pastor went over and said, brother, come to the front. We want to pray. And so they're walking like this, you know. And pastor just, you'd have to know this pastor. He just said, in the name of Jesus, rise and be healed. And the man stood up and smiled. And the elder said, sir, are, are you a Christian? He said, no. <laughs> Jesus is not a Christian. Oh my goodness. He's the Messiah. So he brought him up and we prayed. I don't know what we prayed. Thank you, Jesus. And then... The elder said, well, what should we do, Pastor? He said, here, let's give him some money. He can go get a meal, get one. And he said, no, I, I don't need your money. I said, oh, okay. This lady from the back came up. She hadn't heard this dialogue. She, she had a lot of money. She moved with compassion. She, she tried to hand him a lot of money. And he said, no, I, I don't need your money. And he reached in his pockets and pulled out $2,000 of brand new crisp bills. They said, well, take him down to the gatehouse and let him use the phone, call him a taxi. Then the pastor and his wife and I, Reshma wasn't on this trip, I wish she had been. We went out back to the hotel to have a meal and fellowship. And, you know, after the fellowship, the pastor was, and his wife were driving home in his car. And, and he, he was thinking back on the evening and went, wait a minute. Lord, we prayed that you'd show up and you never did. And the Lord said, oh, but I did. And this man's face came up. He slammed on his brakes, pulled over to the side of the road, got his phone out and said, where did that guy go? And the, the elder said, Pastor, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but when we took him down to the gate shack, the gate, you know, the guardhouse, we dialed the phone number, we're going to hand it to him, and he vanished. And the pastor drove around two hours looking for him. I said, brother, your car does not get that kind of gas mileage. Nah. So he told me the next morning this story about him vanishing. And as he's telling me the story, I heard the Lord laughing at me. <laughs> this is why. He gave me exactly what I asked for. I said, I, have, I asked that he would come in the room and everybody would see him. I forgot the recognized part. <laughs> well, does God do that? That's scriptural. After resurrection, he peered upwards of 500 people at one time. In that night, God appeared to Solomon. At the end of the age, in the night, the darkness that we now have, God's appearing to millions. And if you're born again, you're already scheduled in. So he said, ask what I shall give you. This is what Solomon answered. Second Chronicles 1.8. Solomon said to God, you have shown great loving kindness to David my father and have made me to reign in his place. Now, Lord God, let your promise to David my father be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge so I can go out and come in among this people. For who can judge this, your people, that is so great? Now here's something about rest. When you walk in rest, your intellect is not in the preeminent position. Your spirit is. I like to say it this way. When we're, we're, when we're after the flesh and something happens in front of us, we react. That's flesh. But if you're at rest, you respond. That's spirit. When he had this visitation, he wasn't so, he was at rest. And so God asked him a question, and out of his innermost being, he said, Lord, this is the destiny you've given me, so I'm going to ask for the tools to fulfill that. I'm asking for wisdom and knowledge. 
The Lord was so blessed by his answer. He said, not only will I give you what you've asked, I'll give you what you haven't asked. In other words, I will give to you exceeding abundantly above all you have asked or thought because you have pleased me. And so you know the story. Solomon became the wealthiest man there ever was at that time. We were ministering in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Rashman I, some years ago, and it was on a Rosh Hashanah. And frankly, I, I'd forgotten. I mean, I had an expectancy, but I'm, I love worship. I'm a worshiper. So I got into the worship and just going, and all of a sudden I saw a 12-foot angel on the platform with a, with a horn, and I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, well, it's Rosh Hashanah. I went, oh. And I paid attention, and all of a sudden, above the platform, the heavens opened, and the glory of God was so bright, I couldn't even look. But just as I turned, I saw Jesus, and I heard, come up here. And immediately, it was like a, a vacuum, you know. I was on my face before the throne of God. I was worshiping God, prostrate at his feet. I don't know how long that went on. But when I was finally able to stand up, I looked around. <laughs> and there was about 400 people there. I, I can't give you an accurate count, but it was not many. And I'm standing there and, and looking, and then I looked at, and it was the Father seated on the throne, and we could see him from here down, but from there up, the glory was too bright. And he sat there for a moment, and he extended the scepter with his right hand, and he said, up to half the kingdom. And immediately my spirit responded and said, Lord, all of you and none of me, I just want to be like Jesus. And he put it back. And he did it a second time, up to half the kingdom. And my spirit immediately said, Lord, all of you and none of me, I just want to be like Jesus. And the third time, the same response. And after the third time, woof, I'm back in the worship going, what was that? And then this thing kicked in. Is that the best you can do? And it started categorizing, categorizing for me and going through the, all the things I had been asking God for and about, and, you know, da, 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 da. and this thing tried to take control. And it became very evident there was a difference between the voice of my spirit and the voice of my flesh. And you know what happened? I asked the right question. And all those other things were answered in that one question. See, that's rest. When your spirit responds instead of your intellect or your flesh, that's rest. And because of that, the Lord released the answer to all those things I had been asking. We must be a people of rest. And just so you know, that was on a Rosh Hashanah. That's what God was speaking to the church, not to an individual. So as I was standing there saying, what in the world was that? All of a sudden, I had an intense burning on my hand and I looked and there was the signet ring of the house, Messiah. And immediately understood, this generation is going to come of age and enter into maturity. That night, I, I didn't get to share with my wife what happened that night when because they called me up to the front and we started ministering and there was something so tangibly different that anybody that came forward for prayer it was like a volcano went off in me. Just this, Ugh! and God touched and healed everybody of impossible things. My favorite that night, this young man came forward, his, his mother-in-law, is in hospital, four-stage cancer, not supposed to make it through the night, and she's not saved. He said, would you pray? And that spirit in me was going, oh, you bet. I, that's the only way I can describe it. It was like, give me a target. <laughs> we prayed. He left. By the time he got to the hospital and to her room, she was up out of the bed. Totally healed, walking back and forth, reading the Bible and confessing Jesus. Ha! That's maturity, that's rest, that's yours tonight. God is.
is awesome. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives stingily, liberally. You know why God gives liberally? He told me one time. He said, I'm so delighted when my people come to me for wisdom, I just shower it on them. He's just delighted when you worship him by asking him. That's worship. Lord, I need wisdom that's not mine. You're the only one who's got it because you're the God of wisdom. I need some. That's worship. And he just, you got it. It's yours. Friend of our family, Chuck Campbell John, scientist that worked for NASA during the Apollo moon missions. And you know what? They could not mathematically figure out the trajectory to get the Apollo spacecraft to the moon and back because the equation was just not working. And so he, he sat down at his desk. He said, Lord, I need wisdom. What's going on? And the Lord said, you forgot that the sun stood still for, for 24 hours. He went, oh yeah. Shh. And the dial, the sundial went back 10 degrees and he figured, that, and when they took that into the equation, the trajectory worked. Amen. That's the wisdom of God. So Solomon was not only a man of rest, a man who had his spiritual eyes opened, and a man of wisdom, but he was a man of worship. Second Chronicles 5.11, it says, When the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were singers, all of them of Asaph and Heman and Judathan and their sons and their brothers, arrayed in white linen, pay attention to that, having cymbals, psalteries, and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests, sounding with trumpets. It was as the trumpeters and the singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His loving kindness endures forever. That the house was filled with a cloud, the house of the Lord, so the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. He was a man of prayer and worship. He told the priests, we are going to worship, and he offered more on that altar of sacrifices of worship to God than any king that had gone before and since. He worshiped God. As a man of rest with the wisdom of God and a face-to-face -face relationship with God. And God was so pleased he filled that house with his glory. You are the house of God. Yeah. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Let me tell you, worship is not always musical instruments and singing. Worship is honestly, honesty before God. Worship is turning to Him with all your needs because you know He can respond and answer. Worship is complaint towards God. Some of you worship more than you thought. Because it's honest saying, God, I can't do this and I feel like I'm defeated. If you don't, it's worship because you're turning to Him with your cares. Remember the woman of Canaan that came about her daughter who was demon possessed. And she worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. That's what scripture says. That was worship. Worship God every day wherever you're at. And you know what? Be bold in your worship. We're not to be closet Christians. It's time for Christians to come out of the closet. And be bold in your witness for God. Now look, I'm not saying preach on the streets. I'm saying live the life. Recognize him in all that you do. He's worthy. And you'll see the glory of God. And in that mentality, with that aspect, you will bring that glory into every situation and circumstance, and you will see lives affected. Watch God work by praising him, by being a person of rest. 
It's extraordinary what he's doing. Hallelujah, hold on. So not only did he praise and worship God and the glory came, but when he prayed, the glory came. Second Chronicles 7, 1 says, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. Come on. The only other place in the Bible you see that is Elijah on Mount Carmel. The fire came down from heaven when he prayed. That encourages me because Solomon in all of his wisdom doesn't have wisdom like our Jesus who lives in us. Solomon with all of his insight and face-to-face encounters, you know, he started well, he didn't finish well. He, he turned away from God at the end of his life because of the multitude of his wives and their idols and their false gods. Finish well. This is the hour that Jesus created you for. Are you awake now? This is the hour that he created you for. You are the ones that are crossing the finish line. So he chose you to finish well. And that grace is on your life to finish well. When Solomon made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests couldn't enter into the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord. And it had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel, oh, get this, when they all saw the fire come down, and saw the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His loving kindness endures forever. We're in a season when all are going to see the fire of God and the glory of God upon the house of God. Become worshipers of the Most High. Walk in intimacy with Him. Desire Him above all things in your life. And I'll tell you what, He'll be found of you because you are the thing He desires more than anything else in this life. He desires intimacy with you more than you can comprehend. You know what's fascinating about the King, our King Jesus, about the Father? He can meet each one of us in this room tonight face to face at the same time and it'll be so intimate we know we're the only one he's talking to. And you feel like you are the most important person in the universe to him because you are. That's the way he sees every one of you. That doesn't work in our, 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 our intellect but I'll tell you what, in the spirit that's easy because you are his the focus of his attention, the focus of his passion, the reason he died so that you could live and know him. If we understood the, the, the extent of his love and his passion for us, I mean, we'd be on our face forever. By the way, get used to that. It's not uncomfortable in heaven, it's, it's glorious. You know, the worship in heaven, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I love the worship that goes on here. You guys are awesome. But the worship in heaven. We were ministering in Boston, Massachusetts one time and when an old historic church there and they're, they're worshiping and it's just like hitting the roof and bouncing down. And I mean, it was, they'd gone for an hour. We just could not get a breakthrough. And so the pastor came out and said, I'm so sorry. Nothing's happening. What's, I said, just keep worshiping. It doesn't matter. Keep going. So they kept going and and, you know, I'm standing there just, you know, after a while, you, you get tired. But I'm just standing there with my heart directed towards God. And all of a sudden, I'm not given to demonstrations of the flesh. But all of a sudden, my body started moving. And I'm thinking, okay, what's that? And I opened my eyes. And the room disappeared in front of me. And I saw the throne of God. And the river of life.
started flowing towards us and dropped into the room. And when it did, breakthrough came. And I watched before the throne of God as hundreds of millions of people were worshiping the Lord. Now here's what's interesting. They never opened their mouth. And yet, yet, you ever see a sine wave on an oscilloscope? So the frequencies, one wave would go up and the group of people would go down. And these people were just all over the place. And each individual coming out of their innermost being was a sound, a frequency of praise and worship. And the harmony that came together as they would go up and down. And then the sea of glass that they were on sometimes would bump it higher. And this whole tremendous symphony of worship would come up and then it would enter into the heart of the Father. And he would begin to sing back over them. And this, I mean, this began to build and build and build in the crescendo. And I'm, I'm standing here and I've, all of a sudden this sound's coming out of me. And I said, Lord, what is this? He said, my word, the way you read it says, I inhabit the praises of my people. But the way it was truly written is, I inhabit my people who are praise. Oh, remember this. You can become praised. You can become worship if that's your attitude. And he receives it. You, <laughs> you must be worshiping. You're really quiet. It's an awesome God we serve. So if I may, this is what I want us to do. Let's worship God right now. I mean worship, not the praise, the worship. If we can have the, can we have the worship team for a song or two? You guys come up. There's coming a special grace on you right now. A special anointing to lead us in worship into a new place in God. And I'm expecting the fire of God to come down and the glory of God to fill the house.